Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I uh, spent some time in Washington, D.C. last week on a lobbying visit. Uh, first time since, the, well, in about three years. And um, weirdly, I, I managed to cross paths with both Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, on a crosswalk outside the Capitol building and George Santos in a hallway underneath one of the uh, the, the house buildings. Um, it was weird. Fortunately for me, I do not have any dealings with their offices, so there was no staff meeting related to that. But uh, yeah, just one of those. Ah, yeah, that's who that is. Fine. So anyway, it, it was a good trip, though. There were a, a ton of useful meetings, largely to, to introduce my association to, to congressional staff and figure out what their boss's pharma-related priorities might be in the next two years. Um, more of that ahead and stuff that I can't talk about, talk about because of work and confidentiality and stuff. But I'll say that I was pleasantly surprised at how, you know, how um, well thought out some of their positions were on things. I, I went in expecting a certain mindset and, and discovered there was a lot of flexibility and a lot of uh, room for conversation. So that was good. And the day after that, that was Wednesday and Thursday last week. The day after that, I went into New York to attend a book panel at Rizzoli Books featuring recent guest Thomas Woodruff and artist Keith Mayerson, who I subsequently pitched on, on recording and seems to be up for it, um, although we'll have to do a, a remote. Um, the event was a blast. Uh, the two of them had a, a really great conversation, uh, some good Q&A. And Rizzoli is just a wonderful bookstore, not as great as the the old location, but times change. Uh, and I got to meet with another past guest, uh, Anita Kunz, who was in town for her new exhibition uh, opening. And I got to gab with upcoming guest Leela Corman, uh, who recognized me um, in my my strange, strange look. Um, and I got to schmooze with some other potential guests. Just met met a woman at the cash register. We were both looking at, at Meyerson's book and um, we got to gabbing and we've emailed subsequently and hope to record sometime this spring. Uh, I'll fill you in on that later on. Um, then met other people while I was just standing online to, to get the book signed. And well, anyway, I... I you know, it was just neat getting to do something like I used to do, which is going into the city on an evening for a little culture. It wasn't like a day trip. I just left the house at 445, uh, got to the city, took the subway, went to this thing, turned around, stopped at Fairway to pick up some coffee and some other stuff, and then then got home. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a little refreshing. It was like it was like the before time, except, you know, with a mask and, and my crazy hair. Oh, yeah, that was the uh, the other funny thing that happened. See, I was walking from the subway stop on 28th Street over to the bookstore. And on the subway, I had tied up all my hair so I would look a little less crazy. Um, and I happened to untie it just when I was walking past some, I'm not sure if it was like a storefront or a bar or a club. I, I couldn't quite tell. There's a sort of, um, well, there's a line of like two dozen youngish black people lined up to get in somewhere. And I, I couldn't tell just as, as I was walking by. But but in that moment, I untied my hair and the breeze that was going on just sort of blew my locks back. And and I heard one of the women online just say, yes, hair, as I passed her. And I, I nodded in acknowledgement and, and felt pretty good about that. Um, so that was pretty awesome because I don't get much of that out, out here in the uh, the woods of New Jersey. The deer don't really uh, you know compliment me on my, my strange hair growth. Anyway, anyway, that's me prattling on. Let's get to this week's show. Um, my guest this time around is James McMullen, the artist painter, instructor, and, and illustrator primarily, and whatever. We'll just call him an artist and, and be done with it. Um, 
James is best known for painting the posters for Lincoln Center Theater here in New York City or in New York City for more than 30 years. Um, he also authored a book called High Focus Drawing about his method and philosophy toward figure drawing, um, which has taught me yet more things that make me feel like a, a failure at drawing and, and have me doubting even more of my my ability to put anything on paper. Um, but it does have me doing some more thoughtful sketches of of my dog, Bendico, because he's the only person or the only being here that poses for me for more than 10 seconds. Um, in fact, after we wrapped up the, the podcast, James took a look at some of my drawings and sketches that I had with me. And then he literally just went over to his drawing desk, took out some tracing paper, laid it over some of my drawings and did these quick sketches over them or just lines over them to show me where, where lines could have worked better. Um, it was absolutely illuminating and yet another experience I never would have gotten if not for this darn podcast. Um, anyway, last November, uh, James, we'll call him Jim. Jim released a book called Hello World, The Body Speaks in the Drawings of Men from Pointed Leaf Press. It's a uh, sort of coffee table sized, a little under 100 pages, and it consists of Jim's sketches of, of men, except... They're not pencil or ink sketches. They're they're done using gouache and bristle brushes, like directly, not not you know studied in in other uh, you know, again not not done with pencil or ink or anything. So, so the figures are made of strokes of color and and white space, and they're just incredible to look at. Like his his understanding of form and weight and light, they're apparent in, in each figure. But his use of, of basically non-realistic color to get across those bodies more more loosely and expressively is just a uh, well, it's just amazing. Um, and as someone who's never really drawn from a model, I, I sort of marvel over how much Jim has internalized all of this and how how well his his shorthands work and and how the colors manage to evoke so much of the, the, the energy of the models. And he clearly loves the male form, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and most of the drawings also have a couple of words of captions in a, a painted cursive hand explaining a little of, of what triggers or centers each drawing. And the introduction is in the same style, just two pages of just a few lines in that, that same cursive. And it's... It's really all about the the energy of the models as expressed through these these brush strokes of color. And this will sound weird. And the realization that there's no shortcut to that understanding Jim's developed and that understanding has developed over 80 or so years of, of drawing. He, Jim is 88 years old, by the way. I am. Um, I don't know how else to talk about Hello World. I'll, I'll put some images in the the show and episode notes for this one, as well as some links to the book, so you can you can check it out. But uh, yeah, it's really just a marvel to look at to to see the understanding and the expressiveness he brings to this this work and the you know going with this chosen limitation, you know, something that doesn't allow for correction, erasing, etc., and and tries to find the essences in these, these bodies and, and what the eye sees anyway. Um, hello world. Uh, the body speaks in the drawings of men by James McMullen, uh, pointed leaf press, awfully good. And, and just, well, for me, instructive in, in a, a lot of ways, in, especially in concert with high focus drawing, which we'll also talk about came out decades earlier. We'll also talk about that during the, the show. Anyway, Jim is good friends with Ed Sorrell, the great artist, illustrator, cartoonist, etc., who I recorded with in November of 2021. And after I rapped with Ed, Jim was the first person he suggested I record with. So when you hear Jim talk about Eddie, that's that. Um, Jim was also pals with the late Milton Glaser and with the still with us, Walter Bernard, who were both on the show in 2019. And what I'm trying to say, in other words, is he's in the uh, the Pantheon, and I'm, I'm awfully glad he was able to give me time for a conversation. 
Now, as caveats go, uh, Jim got up a few times to check books or get art to show me. And um, he also opens and closes some flat files a few times. So it kind of messes with the audio flow a little bit. Um, I edited around that stuff generally. Uh, also, I screwed up my mic's audio level in the last 15 or 20 minutes of the episode because I was trying to compensate for Jim moving around. He was behind me at one point, so I was trying to catch that on the mic. Didn't reset it, so, um, you know, it, it, it's a little weird. You'll forgive me, I hope. Um, there are also a few moments where it goes and shows me some art that I did not take pictures of afterwards, um, so you're going to have to imagine. I could have tried editing those out, but I'd rather tease you and let you imagine what I got to see. Now, here's Jim's bio from the book. James McMullen's 90 posters for Lincoln Center Theater include Anything Goes, Carousel, The Front Page, and My Fair Lady. His paintings of a Brooklyn disco for New York Magazine became the visual inspiration for the movie Saturday Night Fever. With his wife, Kate, he has created many children's books, including the perennial favorite, I Stink. His other books include Revealing Illustrations, the theater posters of James McMullen, and the illustrated memoir of his World War II childhood, Leaving China. He taught drawing at the School of Visual Arts in New York City for more than 20 years. His new book is Hello World. And now, the virtual memories conversation with James McMullen. Tell me about Hello World. Tell me where, where it began, what the, we can tell us what it is. I'll talk about that in the introduction, but you know, we'll start at the end. Tell me about Hello World. Well, I would say since the age of 15 or so, um, I always loved to draw and, uh, we used to get National Ge Geographic magazine in China. We didn't get lots of other magazines, but we got National Geographic. And I loved to look at photographs and copy them and draw them and everything. But then, you know, as I grew older, I realized that the figure, the human figure, was central to what interested me in the world, more than landscape or, <clears throat> or still life. I mean, I certainly have done a lot of landscape and still life in my life, but it's it's the human figure that really uh, fascinates me, and it's partly because I was uh, a sissy kid who was always on the fringes of activities. You know, I was the um, I was not good at sports, so I was not chosen. <laughs> you know, for the soccer team or the cricket team or whatever it was. And uh, so I was always looking at other people doing doing things, and particularly other boys, because it fascinated me. Uh, and, of course, it, it, it challenged me, too, that this is what I'm not, you know. But... Um, so I, I guess you'd say that I, I have a kind of voyeuristic view of the world, you know, that I'm the guy on the sidelines looking at what's happening. And um, and so um, when early, I mean, I, I had success as an illustrator pretty, pretty soon. I mean, in art school, I was doing... I was doing drawings for Harper's Magazine, uh, you know, uh, pretty young. <laughs> and so I was able to make a living pretty quickly as an illustrator. Um, and so um, I realized I could teach, because I've always had that, bec because I suppose I, I have this voyeuristic view of the world. I also have a kind of emotionally analytic view of the world. In other words, I, am, I, I do understand how other people are, are operating in the world yeah. uh, given their, their attitudes, the way they speak, and all of that stuff. 
So I, I thought I, I could teach. So I, I, I started teaching in the night school at SVA. And uh, um, <laughs> I did something really weird. When I decided to teach in the night school at SVA, I put it off for a semester, and I went to the new school of social research, and I took handwriting analysis. Yeah. Because I felt that what I could help young illustrators to do was to find their authentic selves in their work. Hmm. And I felt that the way that they they made letters, that they in cursive writing, they would reveal a lot about themselves. So that to sort of teach against what they brought in as assignments and talk about it in relationship to their handwriting would be a, a really interesting thing to do. <laughs> and so I did it for a semester, and it it showed me that, okay, maybe there is some linkage there somewhere, but it, you, you, you can't, in a practical way, you can't find it quickly enough or use yeah. it, you know. The weird thing is that those um, students, several of those students from that semester, and, you know, it was when I was like maybe 32 years old or 30 years old, I don't know, it's a long time ago, they are still in touch with me. In other words, there was something yeah. intense about uh, that semester. And it was probably the sense of me struggling. In other words, it bonded us that yeah. they were struggling, I was struggling, mm -hmm. you know. And, but but I, I was trying very much to, to get at something deep inside them and use it in their work and everything. So, but the other thing it showed me is that I really wasn't interested in teaching illustration, that teaching concept, teaching narrative, uh, I, I, it's very, I just felt it's a hopeless task. Uh, uh, but I said I, I could teach people to draw, you know. And if I can teach them to pay attention to the human figure, they will start paying attention to life in general in a much more intense way. They will have given their sense, given them a, a kind of mental discipline and a, and a mental process that is going to help them in deciding what kind of story they want to tell in their illustrations, you know, how to tell it, what the hierarchies are within that story. You know, all of these things could be taught through getting them to pay attention on this much higher level than the way that, that, that they did. I know I'm taking a long time to oh, get no, to this, please. but yeah. it is sort of, you know. And I was joking when I say we're starting at the end, because this okay. whole thing feels like a culmination. Of, right, of, it is yeah. a culmination. And um, the, the, in order to, uh, in other words, to teach drawing, I had to sort of say, why do I, t why do I draw so well? You know, it's always been obvious that, that you know, I just have this natural talent to draw. I mean, Milton Glaser used to say he draws like an angel, you know. Um, so I had to say, why do I draw so well, you know? And I realized how, how intuitive, it, intuitive it is, how much you have to give yourself over to what you are drawing uh, and and try to get at its spirit, right? And in thinking about all the ways that drawing was taught at that time, and still is, I have to say, uh, in art schools, I saw what the problem was, that drawing is hard. It's a very subtle process that brings a lot of things, hand, mental, eyes, all kinds of things. And so when people want to teach drawing or want to talk about drawing, they want to find a way to make it a system. So there are all, there are all these books out there that 
treat like the human figure, like a piece of furniture. Let's look at the structure. Let's take it apart piece by piece. Let's look at it in light. Let's, you know. Uh, and, of course, as soon as you put your mind into that programmatic frame of, frame of mind, you have cut yourself off from the very thing you need at that moment, which is to give yourself over to what you're looking at. And st instead of sitting back and saying, how do I control this thing that I'm looking at? How do I piece it, you know, and make it something predictable so that every time I draw, I can depend on that. You know, I start, you know, with, uh, I always start with a spine. I make a line. I, I make a line for the shoulders, you know, all that kind of thing. It just, it just cuts you off in, from the humanity of, you know, wh what you're looking at. And uh, so, you know, I, before I taught drawing, I didn't have to think about what was involved because it came to me naturally. I, I recognized that it was because I was willing to say, I'm not the miracle. The figure I'm looking at is the miracle, you know, and to control my ego in that sense and to not think about fucking style. You know, I mean, yeah. what in 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 this book when I t when and you're, you're I, in high focus drawing, yeah, high focus drawing. You know, when I talk about student progress, I mean, not in every case, but in several cases, the students come in with, "This is how I make a line." You know, I do this kind of line. It's sort of scribbly, and and it's me, it's mine. I can I control the drawing. You know, I use the model to make something that is mine, 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 you know. And it, of course, destroys the very thing you need at that point, which is to openness, openness, you know. So, uh, so anyway, I, you know, I, I guess pretty quickly uh, understood this, that w what I needed to do with my students, you know, and, you know, to stop them to see them to see drawing the model as a, a style exercise and what I would say to people I said I know you know here you are in this field of illustration and everybody's telling you that what's going to make you successful is to have a style you know so you are concerned about style and, and certainly in the marketplace Art directors are looking for some kind of identifiable, identifiable style. I said, but let it go because your style bubbles up naturally mm -hmm. through the way that you see the world. All of these things will make your style. You don't have to be so controlling yeah, to about overlay your style. It instead. Yeah. What? To, to overlay the style instead of letting yes, it... Yes, letting the style yeah. evolve out of the very fact that you see the world as you are and that your your father beat you up and you know, your mother was nice to you. Uh, all of these things uh, are yeah. going to affect how you see the world and they will naturally be there. But right now, you just have to uh, open yourself as much as possible. And, you know. and then I... I, in terms of the human figure, I said, the, the, I would do this little exercise at the beginning of the class, at the beginning of the semester. I would say, okay, let's all stand up. And we'll just stand up and straight, fine. Just you're totally balanced. You're very symmetrical. Now, take your right foot and put it out eight inches and move your toe out like that. And I said, now, what do you feel? You feel everything going up to your head because you have made that, because whatever you choose to do, the whole body cooperates right. in making that happen. So that there is this wonderful rhythmic cooperation that's happening in the human figure, that if you, if you just allow yourself to tune into it, and instead of seeing distance, thickness, you know, just allow yourself to see function and all of your worries about measuring will also solve themselves because it's so much more powerful 
to when when the model goes like this, instead of saying this to this, this to this, this to this, just think of reaching. Think of the eyes looking at the hand. Think of of the of the whole action in terms of all of the things, the shoulder blade, everything having to cooperate in order to do that. And if you let yourself see it, you will see it, you know. And time, I, I mean, I think one of the most important and um, perhaps unique things about high focus drawing is that section on student progress. Because the it, end where you're yeah, at because the end. it gave yeah, me yeah. a chance to show uh, that that each individual student opens up to you know to the human body but they open up in their own way but they get it you know and they leave behind all of this egotistical it's my line it's my style yeah. it's you know like all of that thing and they start to have so much more pleasure in in drawing because the human figure then becomes this miracle you know that they they respond to, so that was uh, I, I realized. Eh, I suppose it's partly because you know the kid who couldn't you know do gymnastics like the other boys could uh, is in awe of <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, all of those kinds of wonderful things in the body, and uh, so energy. Uh, I, I, you know, I really stressed energy. We're looking at energy when we look at the body. Even a body lying down, it's a different kind of energy, but there, but there is energy in just the fact that, you know, you support yourself. Yeah. In, well, you, in the book, I mean, you show how that's more challenging oh, in, in high focus drawing because you you need to show the. The pressure, the, the pressure, the, the weight, sense yeah, of the, yeah, exactly. the weight and gravity the weight. of the body yeah. on the ground. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so anyway, um, the uh, you know the first couple of semesters when I taught, I got a lot of pushback from my students because they had all been taught these systems, you know, so that. No, we, we're not supposed to do that, you know. And, and this equals yeah. X number of heads. and, and yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. you know. Uh, um, just, you know, there's yeah. so many systems. Anyway, so uh, towards the three-quarters of the way through that semester, I, I thought, you're on a fool's errand, Jim. They, they want, the students desperately want a system. And what you're saying is there is no system, you know that you, you have to find these things through your own humanity and, you know, your, uh. and then I had this one kid and he was a bad boy, you know, and um, what's that thing that people do with a ball on their feet and they, anyway, it's some kind of game and, you know, between poses, he's always doing the game with his feet and everything, but of course he was incredibly dexterous. I mean, you know, the fact he could do that. Oh, the whole hacky sack thing? Hacky little, sack, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know. and, Flashing back to college. Sorry, go, go yeah, on. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, um, he, he was a, um, a Spanish boy uh, and uh, his drawings were very brutal when he came in to their class. And, but the thing about him was that, first of all, he was athletic. Secondly, he was sensuous. You know, and I could tell that, that in the, the lines, that, yeah, you, you probably, <laughs> your girlfriend probably likes you a lot. <laughs> you know, uh, so, uh, and suddenly he got it. And man, it just went so fast with this kid, you know, that it was almost like I'd given him permission to something that he deeply wanted to do, but never, you know, never, never had the circumstance to do it. And, of course, everybody in the class saw it. They saw what beautiful, you know, what energetic, you know, engaging drawings he was doing. So, one after another, they began to follow his lead and... So by the second semester, I had maybe five students out of 20 
that were really doing well, and they were, you know, um, and and they understood that that it was a deep process. In other words, it, it doesn't something that, you know, the you flip a switch and suddenly you, you draw well forever. No, you you realize how inexhaustible the sense of looking and thinking and feeling is when when you're drawing a figure, and um, and it was it was great. And and then. They were only supposed to take me for one semester. And uh, so they started to come to me and say, we, we want to take you for another semester, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and I said, fine, because exactly, you, you get it, that it, it, you, you just started a, a wonderful journey, you know. And so, so anyway, I got a lot of kids that came to me and I gave them all to, permission to take me for a second semester. And then the uh, the chairman of the department called me into his office and he said, Jim, I'm a little worried about what you're doing. These are not the rules. You're not supposed to teach these. You're not supposed to have them come back. And I'm afraid that you're trying to make a cult. <laughs> And I said, I'm, I'm not really. I'm just accidentally so making a cult, but not that's deliberately. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the weird thing was that this particular guy, heavily tattooed, very, you know, always trying to be more youthful than the students, was himself very much into making himself <laughs> a cult, you know. So, uh, I mean, I think that was part of it, that he was the chairman of the department, but I was the guy out in the world doing <laughs> covers for magazines and, you know, uh, a, a lot of work. So, uh, so anyway, I continued, I mean, and one of the things in, in teaching is that I drew all the time. I, I, and, you know, we'd have class discussions and my drawing would be there and it would give me a chance to say, okay, this is what I saw. Maybe this is something you could see a little more, you know. And um, and it, it, the the students really appreciated it. They they understood that my drawing with them was not like saying, "Look how good I am," and you know, they aim to this. Yeah, it was like that. There were subtle things I could, I, you know, I could show about this pose you just saw, and here's my drawing. Here's your drawing. This is a little bit of what you missed. I mean, a lot of them were doing pretty well, but. Um, so, uh, and the, the other thing I did, and I did it right from the start, I was very, I said, these are the materials you're going to use. You're going to use uh, 19 by 24 um, bond paper pad and uh, 2B and 4B pencils and an eraser and a sharpener. That's it. Because I wanted to stop people bringing in materials that were given the chance to play the style game, you know, this right. is my style, and the, you know that I, you know, and so I want everybody to be on the same literal page. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know that that, and boy, was that good. That was one of the best uh, decisions I ever made was to just have everybody using the same materials because it really gave us a chance to look at drawings and see what was happening and to begin to distinguish, you know, how people were showing who they were through their drawings, you know, not stylistically, but how they saw, you know. And, uh, I mean, some some people were very sensuous in the way they drew. Other people were very kind of cool, you know, but... But they were still seeing the model, but they were seeing it through a certain personality of their own, you know. So this went on for maybe 10 years. And then I said, you know, I want to I want to try something else for myself, you know, because I wasn't getting bored exactly, but I needed a new challenge. So I took a little palette and some... Uh, gouache paint, gouache tubes, and uh, bristle brushes. Uh, 
and I began to to draw with you know in color and uh, but color became totally psychological it wasn't naturalistic at all you know and it it did open up it, it did open up a more expressive channel for me you know i i could say what i felt more emphatically than i could have with just the the 2b pencils or the 4b pencils you know and i told my students if they wanted to try it they could but most of them just said no we're really happy with our pencils and continuing on that i mean it's interesting now i look on on the web and i see these students and they're all <laughs> evolving drawing in, in gouache paint you know and uh, and i'm sort of glad i didn't encourage it in the class because it never was a, a style and I, th I think you can see in this book mm -hmm. that each drawing is is a specific um, reaction to that particular po that particular model, that oh, particular yeah. they're, pose. They're, you know, they're, they're all they're, they're not you know yeah. like you know one one way of working is uh, uh, I mean this is one sense where I'm working with a kind of density and but you know there are other um, oh yeah some are very yeah, very yeah, yeah, very sparse. light yeah, very yeah. you know lots of air in them uh, because that was the way I felt about that particular model you know and sometimes where in this case the the strength of the guy's hip was so <laughs> it got through to me so much that you know I did this Slash of, of emphatic brownish reddish paint, you know, to 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 talk about it. So um, these are um, this um, this was a huge opening up for me, and it was probably the most personal work I've ever done in my life. Yeah, how so? Well, first of all, there's no client involved. You know, there's no you know there's no, no nobody telling me. I want to use this drawing to do something. They're totally useless, you know, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. They they just are what they are. And even as a as a, um, I mean, I I think a, a relatively sophisticated student would get stuff out of looking at these drawings and find something helpful. But they're so personal that I don't think you could call it a how-to book. You know, it's just too. It's. It's too much up in a different sphere of of, of thinking and analyzing and you know um, and reacting. Uh, How did you feel about sharing something that personal? Well, I was sharing something that personal, and uh, was it a difficult choice for you? It was. It was a difficult choice. I've always been controlling a certain aspect of myself, and uh, I guess this reveals a lot about me. I mean, I think my interest in men uh, is apparent in a lot of my work, you know. I mean, sure. if anyone really looks and thinks about it, um, why why am I so good at drawing men, you know? Um, and one of the points I've done a PowerPoint now. I mean, three different versions of a PowerPoint on this book, and I I do uh, get into why men, why not, why aren't there women in this book, you know? And so, in the PowerPoint, I, I show my drawings of women, and I, I've drawn a lot of women in my life, and, you know, I don't draw them badly. But, and I enjoy the harmony and the long, voluptuous lines in women's bodies, and it's, it's, it's very beautiful. But there's something in me that really reacts to the aggression in men's bodies. You know, the either the overt or the incipient aggression 
in men's bodies, you know, this, this sense that What's coiled There's up? There's a challenge. Or, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, and I don't, you know, I don't idealize these people. I mean, I. There's I exaggeration, hope, but not not yeah, idealization. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not drawing beautiful muscles and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I've never particularly been interested. I've tried it a lot in my life of doing, you know, slower drawings and rounding the forms and doing all of that, making them more classical looking. But, you know, my feeling is if, if, if there isn't some reason beyond realism to draw the figure then you might, let, might as well let the camera do the work, you know. I mean, the, the camera does it very well. <laughs> so uh, so this, this is my statement about that, is that I am really trying to get at a life force in these drawings that a camera wouldn't get because I'm able to in, emphasize things that you might not see in a, just, you know, a photograph of, the, of these of these guys. Um, so, um, <laughs> ask me a question. <laughs> How it felt putting this out in the world? Well, it felt great in yeah. this, uh, you know, I'm 88 years old. I'm not, not going to last a hell of a lot longer. And I don't know. All of you push pin guys seem to go into your nineties. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my body is probably going to go in my nineties. I hope my my uh, my mind decides to go along with the ride. Uh, I, I I wanted this out in the world. You know, I mean, it, as I say, it, it's perhaps the most personal aspect of my work I've ever shown the world. And because it had no particular usefulness, there was no other context to to show it in. I mean, when my my agent, who's basically my children's book agent, but she loves these drawings I do and has, has bought some of them over the years. And uh, Anyway, she, she was all for my doing this book. And um, so she took it around to so many publishers. And uh, they all said, oh, my God, this is so fantastic. Uh, we love Jim's work, uh, blah, 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 you know. But not for our list, you know. And I understood that yeah. it doesn't fit neatly into the marketplace of bookstores, and you know, it, uh, it's it is fine art as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But it doesn't have the hallmarks of, of fine art. It's funny. I was in a show downtown with uh, these drawings. I mean, some of them, a few of them. And everybody else was a fine artist. Uh, the husband of the w woman that published owns a gallery downtown, so he, you know, wanted to uh, show them. And my reaction was that all of the other people look more like illustrators than than I did. They were all high concept. You know? uh -huh. And I think that a lot, of, a lot of young fine artists are like that. They, they are looking for concepts. So they're, 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 there was, you know, a lot of this um, sort of, you know... We're high art, but we're stealing and, and trying to get by... Well, no, a, but uh, just like jazzy uh, conceptual okay. stuff, and uh, uh, so uh, so anyway, I decided to to publish it myself. So mm -hmm. I mean, I have a publisher, but I pay for the publishing. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a real. Uh, it's a labor of love a in a certain way, love. and and so it's out there, and and I think. You know, uh, certainly, 
you know, a lot of people like Eddie and uh, Steve Brodner and Steve Heller, I mean, they, they know that I've done something quite extraordinary with this book. Uh, but whether or not it will ever find a real place in the market, I don't know. You know, we'll see. So and uh, We can never trust the market. No, no. Uh, and it's, unfortunately, it's expensive. You know, it was a very expensive book. It was be beautifully printed. You that know, was the thing. I didn't mind buying it because, you know, once it showed up, I thought that's, that's, it's all on the page. Yeah. You know, it's not one yeah. of those you know, where it looks like a, a crappy reproduction or anything. These yeah, things look no, gorgeous. Uh, and fortunately, I've, I've got this young guy that, that uh, works for me um, who is fantastic, you know, with, with uh, scanning and, and, you know, putting all the stuff in. The, the quotes around them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that was really good. Had you felt a, a tension with the fine art world over your career? Was there ever a, no, you know, I, the, the credit I so richly deserve sort of thing? Or, or? No, I, I, I just sort of leave them alone, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It's like... Um, I do stuff that very few of them could do. I mean, I'm quite willing to admit that there are fine artists working on a higher level, metaphysical higher level than I am. But there are a hell of a lot of fine artists that are just, you know... Getting by. Yeah. Getting by, you know. So, uh, um, um, so I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, it's out there, the, the, the status thing, you know, that if you're an illustrator, you're way down on that totem pole of art. But, uh, but the, the th I mean, of course, the ironic thing is that as a good, successful illustrator, you probably have more effect on the culture you're working in than a lot of fine artists do. You know, I mean... Uh, uh, I've just sold my my theater archive to the Library of Performing Arts, you know, and um, I mean, the 91 posters I've done for Lincoln Center Theater are as much about the history of New York theater as a lot of things are, yeah. you know. <laughs> so uh, so I, I haven't felt... Uh, I mean, no... I mentioned Milton because he was a very yeah. dear, close friend of mine for years and years. And, and we, these were things we talked about. And, you know, he took the view that the one I'm just sharing with you that my work is, is, is his work is, is as significant as most any work that any artist does, you know. And, but I think. He did, it hurt him, I think, a little bit more than, uh, than perhaps hurts me, that he, that he wasn't taken a bit more seriously by the fine art world. But he got a one-man show at the Museum of Modern Art, so, you know. Yeah, the world the caught up with him in, in some ways, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. But still, it shouldn't be, it, you shouldn't have to be as talented as Milton Glaser and have that level of career to finally get recognition. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, yeah. So, um, uh, and, and Milton, generally, I, you know, as I've said, I'm a guy that sort of sits on the sideline, probably way too much for my career. But uh, Milton has always been, you know, very not aggressive but powerful in the way that he was in the world. But you know, and working alongside him when I was at Pushpin, I. I saw that, you know, and I I got a little bit from it. In other words, I got a little bit better at, uh, you know, pushing myself into the world, but it was never natural for me. I've always been a guy that is content to to sort of be, to, to let my work speak for itself, you know, and uh, um, I mean... Also, I'm, an, I'm not a New York guy because, you know, all my friends are New York guys. And they, <laughs> they all have that New York attitude and, you know. Growing uh, up in the streets and Yeah, bench. you know, yeah. The, the Bronx and Brooklyn and, you know, it's, it's different. And 
I have this weird China, Canada, uh, India, yeah, England, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, a rootless cosmopolitan. Yeah. I think we uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but where did the Lincoln Center? Where did Lincoln Center begin for you? Where did the the relationship? Well, with it, start? I, I you know who I have to thank is Paul Davis uh, because um, Alexander uh, Cohen, uh, who was a producer, Alex Cohen, um, what, was doing a Mike Nichols play called Comedians, and um, Mike had worked with uh, with Paul at the uh, public theater and was a huge fan of Paul's. And so uh, when he was doing this with Alexander Cohen, he said, I, I want Paul Davis to do the, the poster. And so he, he asked Paul and Paul said, listen, I'm under contract with the public theater. I, I'm not allowed to work for another producer. So... Uh, Mike was very disappointed, but he said, well, who would you suggest? And for some reason, I mean, Paul and I were friends, uh, and I, I was very much friends with, with Myrna, his wife, because she w worked at Pushpin when I was there. Uh, but anyway, he said, Jim McMullen. And it's funny, I mean, I'd done a lot of book jackets at that point, but I don't think I'd, I'd done any theater posters. So anyway, so that was my start, and I did the poster for comedians, and um, it was a big hit. And um, uh, and then I did a couple, maybe five, for Alexander Cohen, and then uh, the guy that had been working for him, a guy called Bernard Gersten moved over to Lincoln Center. And Lincoln Center Theater was trying for the third time to get started. I don't know if you know this history. I don't know it well. That, yeah. But anyway, they built the buildings, and it was all new. It was all great. But no one could make it work, you know. Uh, producers came in, and I, I don't know the mistakes they made, but they either made it, too arcane in some way, or they, but they just couldn't make it work. So they went through two different uh, producers, and then, uh, and I don't know why, I was Greg Mosier was the uh, the new producer. So Greg, uh, I think Greg had been in film actually. But anyway, he, he came and um, he hired Bernie Gersten because Bernie had already worked for uh, the public theater and for Alexander Cohen. So uh, he, he was an experienced producer. So when Bernie started with, uh, with Lincoln Center Theater, the second uh, play they were going to do uh, was The House of Blue, Blue Leaves by John Guare. And Bernie remembered that because of comedians in particular, that I was very good at doing very active posters. And so he... Um, so anyway, they, they, they hired me for uh, The House of Blue Leaves. Um, and then that worked out, and I did the front page and they seemed to like that and then I did Death and the King's Horseman and then I did Anything Goes and that kind of cinched it when I did Anything Goes so yeah. then at that point Bernie said we'd like you to become our poster guy you know be on contract you won't be able to work for anybody else but we'll give you three posters a year to do you know so so that's what started it and uh um, so the first poster I did for them was 1986. Um, so, and, and three a year that'll get you to about 90, 91. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 
as as you can see, energy in the figure is a very, very big part yeah. of my posters, you know. And uh, so uh, that was... Um, Did you feel you had to, let's say, adjust or learn for that, that particular milieu? Either for theater posters or specifically well, for Lincoln Center? Did you feel like you were... Well, I made an adjustment, but it was a very nice adjustment, yeah. actually. Uh, the the thing about me is I've always been a reader. You know, I, I I read very young, and I was fascinated by reading and by stories, and and uh, I I love the density of books and literature, and so that when I was doing, I did a lot of book jackets. Uh, let's see if I can find any. These I was doing really early. Really. For yeah. this guy. Oh, I've, I've read the Alexandria Quartet in my, my youth. There's a different edition. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've seen those on a, on Twitter when various friends of mine start. Yeah. So anyway, these yeah. are, so they, they are posters in a way. You yeah. know, I mean, uh, there, there is realism given a certain emphatic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, reading plays gave me a lot of pleasure in the same way, you know, yeah. to really sink into a play and think about it. And uh, it just meant that it needed to be a little bit more dramatic. In other words, the poster is seen out in the world in a different way than a book jacket is. You know, you don't have it in your hand, you're seeing it. So there, there does have to be uh, an even more sense of emphatic shape and uh, you know um, so it, uh, it was a, t a tiny adjustment I had to make but it was it was still my love of getting into the material you know were you uh, a theater goer or primarily no, a theater I, reader strangely enough I did go to the theater but I you know knowing knowing so many real theater goers you know <laughs> some maniac theater goers I would never call myself. I mean, I'm now doing these posters for this guy that has this little company that I'm, I'm doing posters for him. I mean, he's he's redoing my posters, and um, you know, he I, he's like a maniac theater goer, and yeah. his whole business is uh, based on you know people that love the theater so much and, you know, we'll buy these posters and all that. So, um, but, you know, I, 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 I enjoy going to the theater and, you know, ever since, of course, Lincoln Center, I go to every opening and, uh, um, it, it's great, but I, it doesn't come from my love of the theater. In other words, it, it, it really comes more from the literary side of things that, uh, uh, and I love the com I mean, I love conversations with like John Guare and uh, lots of different um, directors and posts. And uh, if you ever, I can give you a paperback version of that book. I did bring a big tote bag with me, thinking I might be leaving here with books, but you know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I saw uh, excerpts from one of your, I think, from the the theater posters book about the the photo reference and everything else that was going in right, and, and right. be sitting in the rehearsals and, and, yeah. you know, um, so you have the idea of being part of the process while it's being developed so you can come back with, you know, well, actually it's a little bit different than that because yeah. I have to do these posters so far ahead of time. Okay. That a lot of times the cat that hasn't even been casted. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, I mean, maybe the, the principal has been casted, but you yeah. know, uh, I mean, I just went through this with Camelot, my last poster, is that uh, I, you know, had these conversations. I did many sketches, uh, you know, uh, and finally, Adam Siegel, the guy I deal with all the time over there, he said, Jim, we don't know <laughs> the ethnicity of anybody in the cast, <laughs> so give us a... Uh, uh, Something indeterminate. <laughs> yeah, g g give us a, um, a landscape. So uh, I was going to say you could do knights, but they'd have the the, the visors down on their helmets, so you wouldn't be able to determine. To, to so, um, so, anyways, 
this became the first game. Wow. <laughs> I'll take a picture of that before we leave. <laughs> no ethnicity there. <laughs> nope. Just an amazing landscape. You do have a guy in the tree. But... Yeah, I did do the guy in the tree. Yes. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, the best posters, I think, are the ones where I get to deal with the actor, you know, the actress, and talk with them and photograph them, and, you know, uh, where I did this one which is also a pretty recent poster. As an incredibly amateur artist, um, I find working from photos second rate or just uh, difficult compared to... Now, again, keep in mind, my life drawing tends to be trees and they don't move much. Uh, you know, I've, I've gone on from there you know, drawing birds and people and all that, but always from photos. And there's always that sense of, as you put it, you know, the photo is just kind of capturing the light as opposed to seeing, seeing. Yeah, no, uh, I, I, you're absolutely right. That drawing the real world is a hell of a lot better than drawing something captured on a photograph. But on the other hand, when you learn to, 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 to draw well, you can exert the energy. You can see it, you know, in a way that you couldn't be, before you trained your mind to, to, you know, what to look for. Um, um. And for you, the, you know, was there a sense where you, you, you knew you had learned? Not, not when it comes to photos, but just that you had learned to look. I mean, you, you talked about how intuitive it was and that going into teaching that first time, yeah. it was there. But before that, was there a sense of... I sort well, of know I'm what sure I'm there, doing. There, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there was, but I, it probably occurred, you know, 14, 15. So I, I, I don't remember when I began to see that... That you could see. That, that I could see into subject matter more, just, more than just, you know, the surface of subject matter. Is there something... You mentioned, again, 91... Lincoln Center posters, and they've done a collection, uh, a permanent collection of these also. When you look back on 30 plus years of these, do you, what, what do you feel? Do you, do you have a sort of horror of retrospection or, you know? No, I okay. feel what a privilege it <laughs> yeah. was, you know, what a privilege it was to, to do that and to, to have found, to, to have found this form of work which used, you know, my unique talents in a way, you know, my, my, my talent for reading and thinking and then pu putting that thinking into graphic concepts, right, you know, uh, and, uh, and the figure and, and to, to uh, I mean, it was the other miracle was that the, the, the people at Lincoln Center got it pretty quickly because I remember a friend of mine, I had a show uh, out in, at the Art Center at, in Pasadena a couple of years ago of my posters. And, uh, uh, I, and this friend of mine who's an illustrator, he walks into it and he looks around and he says, how the hell did you get away with it? <laughs> <laughs> because they are you know, the the wonderful thing was that there was no um, there was no advertising agency or uh, people analyzing uh, no sales force telling yeah. them you can't do that poster it doesn't have enough sex or love or you know romance or you know uh, they somehow they somehow got it okay, this, this isn't what we expected, but we got to admit there's something going on here that we mm -hmm. think will interest people. And then what happened was the fact that my posters were so different than what everyone else was doing, uh, that became part of, of their identity. And actually, uh, the head of Lincoln Center... Uh, just uh, did a piece in Airmail magazine 
saying exactly that. We, we owe Jim our identity because of his particular take on things, you know. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's pretty obvious uh, is that we live, we have lived, and we still live to a great degree in a visual area era which in which everything is seen from the waist up because cameramen roaming around the world are always taking it yeah. and people want to see faces and 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 they they want to have that intimacy and i'm i show feet <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, because I mean, for instance, uh, Paul Davis, you know, who's a one, you know, terrific poster artist, and but you know, he d does the more graphic design thing, which is to come up close and make powerful heads, uh, you know, and which is great. But it's not my thing to do, you know, uh, and and somehow or other, I got away with it, you know, I, I got away with backing up and seeing that the whole body is telling you a story, not just not just the face, you know, and just where the feet are, for instance, yeah. uh, tells you a story. Yeah. Um, I, I don't look back with any regrets uh, in, in that sense, you know, I mean... Do you uh, see progress of any kind? Do you see things that maybe a 2005 poster, you're like, I, I couldn't have done this in 1986, but, you know, or is it just, again, the continuum no. of your, uh, your work? The opposite may be true. Yeah, I know. There's always that, <laughs> that side, too. Man, I was a lot better when I was young. <laughs> well, also, uh, in the last couple of years, Lincoln Center has gotten a bit more conservative mm -hmm. uh, because the world has gotten more difficult for yeah. the theater, you know, so... Um, they like two years ago they replaced my poster which they loved and you know uh, with with the photograph of the two actors looking at each other like that you know uh, because their sales people told them that's what people want they want you know yeah. you know, just uh, so uh, so I've, I've been lucky, and and uh, and also you know the whole world is, has has in the the world of illustration has completely changed by a computer, you know. And sure. I'm Eddie and I, Eddie Sorrell and I, uh, uh, and Steve Brodner, uh we're we're one of the few people that are still working on paper and and paint and brushes and all that stuff and yeah. pens. It's funny, but like every illustrator, <laughs> it's probably self-selecting on my part, but every illustrator I record with, the guys you mentioned, although Brodner is a, a no because he's afraid he'll say something embarrassing on mic, uh, Chardello, Cuneo, Blit, yeah. uh, uh, Mark Ulrichson, everyone, it's still it's, working on. It's yeah. the physical medium, not, yeah. not you know, yeah. digits. Yeah. But, so, but, yeah. you know, what all of us, I mean, I'm the oldest of this crew, but uh, I'm, I'm the ones you mentioned. Uh, we all have to accept, okay, the world is changing, and the art directors are now the art directors that were in in art school with the illustrators that they're using, you yeah. know, so the whole tenor of the thing changes. And extraordinary things can be done on the computer. I have to admit that there are some elaborate uh, illustrations that I see that uh, would be very hard to do without using... Do you subscribe to Milton's belief that, that the computer ultimately constrains you into doing the things computers are good at doing? Absolutely. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I agree with that. You know, And, and also, I, I feel that you cannot learn to draw very well if you're just drawing on an iPad, you know, that with, without the, the physical resistance of paints and paper and stuff like that, it becomes so cold, you know. Uh, I've tried once or twice. I've got one of those Apple pens and I try yeah. like this is, and again, I'm a novice, but there's still something to be said for the line on the page yeah. and the, 
Yeah. For me, doing it in ink, yeah. like Ed, it's the, yeah. the irreversibility. Well, that line's there. I'm not doing anything with it now. So. Well, the other thing about the computer illustration, uh, that you constantly correct. You, so there are no mistakes. You yeah. know, I mean, it's all like perfect. And my work has always been done in a state of risk. And um, I'm, I'm willing to let some of that risk show, you know, and... Uh, you know, well, I mean, if anyone looks at the books on my work, they know how many times <laughs> I do things over. And uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so I mean, three years ago, I suppose if you talked to me, I would have been angry, and uh, people shouldn't. They should be going back to pencil and paper and all that, but. No, I just feel no. The world has changed, Jim. You've you've had your shot. You've had a very good run, and um, it's natural that it, that everything is changing. And um, and thank God I've got you know Eddie to talk to, and we can moan and groan <laughs> about how uh, we we've come to the last chapter for sure. Uh, so, but. Um, but that's that's another reason for, you know, about this book that it was it, it was a, uh, just a way of showing the energy of me, you know. That you know, I, I'm I'm the sissy kid who became powerful through art. You know, I do feel that I have. You know, I have power in art, which is the reason I can, I can teach because, I, I really have, something. That is powerful that I can explain and share, you know, with with people. So. I think this. I felt that these drawings I do, are, are powerful, unique drawings, and and so. As something that you know is at this point in my life, it's it's good to be able to express that in these drawings and to collect them and, and show them. You know, so uh, it reminds me a little in in high focus drawing in, in the other book where, yeah. <laughs> where we're talking about, uh, where you have a, a Matisse nude uh, near the beginning yeah. and you know explain this is not what students should be aiming for. You know, he yeah. can do this because. Thousands upon thousands of drawings yeah. enabled him to, to find yeah. these essences. Um, it's very reminiscent of, of what's in Hello World in terms of this isn't necessarily how you're supposed to do it. This is how I see it, and this yeah. is how a lifetime integrating these tools right. into to my Absolutely. my sense. Couldn't have said it better. Okay, I'll do the blurb <laughs> for the next edition. <laughs> but are there? Uh, this is something I always ask with 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 artists and illustrators. Are there? Um, Materials or, or tools that you can't get a hold of nowadays that you used to rely on things that just like uh, oh my god I wish they had Zipatone you know which <laughs> well I can't I, I can't get um, the great English paper anymore yeah. the watercolor paper uh, I've adjusted to the kind of paper I can get and, and, and I yeah. but um, I guess about twelve years ago I invested. Eleven thousand dollars in a um, bunch of paper, <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm pretty much through the best of it. So, uh, uh, was there a calculation of this will last me beyond the time that I can no, keep drawing or yeah, painting? <laughs> Haley Mills is the paper, and the the really good stuff is this very. I see. Uh, this, uh, Rough. Hmm. I can I, I still have a lot of Watman, but it's, the Watman is a little bit too too uh, smooth for what for what I want to do. You know, my work in watercolor depends a lot on fusions. You know, and you need a, a bit of texture uh, in the paper in order to to control the fusions. If the paper is too smooth, the fusions sort of go off and become erratic. 
Uh, it's a little of what I, I meant with that, that John Lurie thing, just seeing the way the, uh, uh, the pigment was dispersing into this and, uh, and blending. I'm like, yeah. that, that makes me want to go make art. You know? yeah. Nothing from the rest of his, his, right. his talk did, but you know, just, just yeah. seeing those visual moments got me. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing hands. about these drawings is they they don't they're not like the rest of my work yeah. in in the the sense well they're not watercolor so they're more pigment as line you know it's essentially line whether the line is a big scratchy thing like that or the perimeter line it's nevertheless the impulse is linear. But linear thinking about uh, about volumes yeah. at the same time <laughs> it's complicated <laughs> do you feel you're still learning I mean th this feels like an opening out hello world does uh, of you know again the idea of continuing yeah, maybe. to I, um, I do think maybe I, I I hit the apex maybe five years ago Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe I just don't have the same intellectual or energy that I did. Uh, I'm still doing it, and I, but it takes me. I, I do a lot of not such great drawings. The big okay. question I never actually asked is: uh, What were your influences artistically? Who were you? Consciously or unconsciously, uh, I mean, you mentioned the the National Geographic, you know, starting point, yeah, but that's not yeah, yeah. the same thing. Well, um, I I think um, the German expressionist drawers, Egon Schiele. Um, uh, let me look at. Uh, they they were they, what they showed me was. Max Beckman was also a big influence on me. I mean, you can't really see it in my work, but you know, the attitude of his drawings were very powerful to me. All these books from my old school days are falling apart, but you know, they were just great drawings. I think he had a thing about penises. <laughs> No, no, it's just a candle. That's okay. Yeah, just a candle. <laughs> just a, there's a candle in every fucking drawing, <laughs> painting. But I mean, that's a. I think it's a uh, woodblock print. Yeah, it's like a Lind Ward sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that was certainly uh, an influence, um, and. You know, when, I, when I got to Pratt, which is where I went to art school, um, this straight out of the army, um, I had a lot of catching up to do, going to the museums and everything. Because I, I, the the other the other uh, students at Pratt, they'd all gone to the High School of Art and Design, and they were all so hip; they knew everything. You know? <laughs> so, but I I. I just, I was hungry for seeing all well, this art. So, you know, I, 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 that period really opened me up. Did you get stuck in the same uh, uh, artist from your decade and, and after that art school was primarily non-representative, non-figurative non drawing, that everything was still abstract focused? Or were you... What was your experience, I guess, with, with well, art school yeah, itself? Yeah, I mean, it, and when I was going to art school, it w was heavily, uh, you know, uh, abstract expressionism was was very big, and um, there was a. Uh, I mean, that's one thing I I talk about a little bit in the drawing book, is the contempt people had for figure drawing. You know, that it's so old hat. Who needs it? Or, you know, and. Um, but Ed talks about that great in his uh, his memoir. The when you can see his visual attempts at trying to do designy type drawings yeah. instead, and then you feel like, yeah. yeah, clearly that wasn't going to work. He had yeah. to become Ed. You know, that's yeah. that's yeah. I never 
I, I, I never lost faith in just going for what I wanted to go for, despite yeah. the fact that it, uh, uh, I was seen as uh, not the hippest yeah, of, a throwback, uh, yeah. you know, of, of the students. That, uh, but w- but what helped me was that uh, the program is a, a liberal arts program, besides being an art school, and um, I had. Uh, we took uh, social studies and history, and and uh, I had a wonderful teacher in, I guess it was history, and I began to write essays, you know, and um, he took these essays and he showed them to other classes because they were so good, and I realized that I had a certain intellectual possibility, you know, that was going to help me. And it has, you know, as I've said, that reading and thinking and, you know. Sort uh, of a symbiotic yeah, relationship yeah. with the, yeah. the visual. Yeah. Right. So, uh, just, yeah, despite the fact that some of, you know, the other students who were very busy being hip <laughs> thought I wasn't too hip, uh, Again, you're an outsider also, and a voyeur, remember? Yeah, right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, the, the expressionists were really the the visual key for you yeah, at that, that yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> I just reminded, when I was in the Army, I made friends with this other guy who was an artist, and, you know, after the Army, we still sort of kept in touch, and he ended up being an assistant to... Uh, uh, Who's the great abstract expressionist? Uh, Pollock, de Kooning. Uh, de Kooning. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, anyway, one day he said, why don't you come over and I'll introduce you to de Kooning and everything. And I said, great, let's go. So I went over and this friend John and I sort of sat on the sidelines while de Kooning was at a table having drinks with this very attractive young couple, guy and girl, and I I said to John, what's going on? (laughs) And he said, well, the um, de Kooning has given them a print, but he hasn't signed it. So what you're hearing (laughs) is the negotiation of whether the the wife is going to sleep with him in order to get the signature. (laughs) <laughs> and that was art. <laughs> oh, man. I probably shouldn't tell that story. Oh, it's okay. He's not around. Okay. <laughs> Nobody will know who right. the, the couple was. But I guess last question, which I should have warned you uh, was coming, because uh, I always ask people this. Who are you reading? You mentioned being a big reader. Do you have any uh, books you're working on at present? Um, well, I'm reading a, a biography. Uh, a biography of uh, Gord, Gore Vidal uh, because um, you know he's been a, a figure in uh, in the time of my life sure. and he's an interesting character and people were always telling me when I was young that I looked just like Gore Vidal <laughs> so of course yeah, he was a good looking man so yeah <laughs> uh, what, what have I just finished I, I don't know um no, you, you remembered more than most people do when I blindside them with this All one. Right. So, okay. Yeah. so that's okay. Yeah. The, um, the master. The magician. Oh, the Calm Toybin? The magician? Yeah. yeah. Fascinating book. Uh, well. That's the one about Thomas Mann, right? Yeah, because yeah. I love Thomas Mann's work. So, uh, Yeah. It's funny, that book came up last year when I was recording with Anne Catanio, who was a dramaturg for... Oh, for Lincoln Center yeah, Theater. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, we got a whole Lincoln Center tie-in. And, and oh, yeah, yeah, she lived... Yeah. I think she's down in Midtown, uh, uh, further down. But, but yeah, I think she had <coughs> just been reading it then, being yeah, a big uh, yeah. Tomas Mann no, fan. I like her. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was fun to record with, although uh, getting the two of us in, fr- uh, in frame for a picture afterwards is a little yeah. difficult because she was 
not particularly tall. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's nice when guests can kind of tie together like that. That's awesome. Yeah. But, I shudder to ask, but uh, what do you see next? You know, do you do you continuing what you're doing with with the, the gouache sketches? Uh, is there something you, you look at and say, you know, this is the, the thing I'd really love to do? And I know, 88 years old, there's there's you know uh, perspective I, there, on that. I, I mean, I I occasionally get work from the New York Review of books. Um, I've got something coming out next week. Uh, so, but, but the, that kind of illustration is really dried up. Sure. Uh, I don't know when Lincoln Center is, they're doing fewer and fewer plays. My possibilities at Lincoln Center Theater have, have sort of shut down a bit. Um, it's crazy. And, uh, but it's, you know, it, it is a generational change that creates these problems. So, um, so I, d I don't know. I mean, right now, you know, I've got a show coming up in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> uh, I'm speaking at various places in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the Library of Performing Arts, once I'm speaking there, and I guess they're going to try to use me uh, a bit um, now that my work is there, you know, and um, I don't know. I mean, my wife is working on a a, a kids book about uh, birds, and uh, if 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 she gets that done, I'll probably illustrate it. So I'm hoping that yeah, I'll do. Uh, the uh, this whole COVID thing has been very hard on publishing. I've done many book proposals that just get turned down, and um, I did a kiss book. I did the whole thing and about a farm tractor, and th then they, <laughs> the very inexperienced editor showed it to farmers and they said that I had gotten several details wrong. And so they wanted me to do major revisions on the book. And the revisions would have taken the wit out of the book. And I just saw no reason to do it. So I gave them back their money and, you know, after all that work, I mean, months of work. Mm. So it's been, you know, complicated time that way. And so, um, so I, I don't know. What 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 I'll do? I'm, uh, uh, but painting for joy. Is there any sense of of you know sketchbook and and how much of that is is part of your life? I guess you know how how much art do you make when you're not making I'm, it for I'm uh, for work? A big sketchbook guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe I should be. Maybe I should be going out in the world and and. Uh, um, I mean, for one reason, I've been so busy that yeah, I haven't needed to do that, you know. But, uh, I mean, I think if we still lived out in Sag Harbor and had the house in Sag Harbor, maybe I'd be doing more landscape and things of that sort. I, I'll show you. Hold on. Sure. Sag Harbor, there was so much construction going on around me that I started to do these little oil paintings <laughs> of construction. Yeah. Uh, wow. And I really enjoyed them. They're on uh, Jesso, you know. So uh, that, I think, is the sort of texture that seems to suit me these days, you know, this slightly scratchy... Uh, Picture. Yeah. Um, so I was doing those. And I, I probably, eh, maybe I could do them in the city too. I have been thinking about going back to oil paint a little bit. You do have all the construction across the street too. We yes. can work on that. <laughs> There's <laughs> but, a lot of construction I could be painting in, in New York. Though, you know. Yeah, I had this moment when I got here. I'm like, oh boy, I hope they're not doing, you know, Saturday morning 
actual construction. Right, right. But, yeah. but the thing I want to leave off with, um, I have to tell you, the first listener of mine who suggested we get together uh, before Ed and, and Joe Chardello, who also recommended you, um, a listener... Uh, artist, uh, former advertising guy and cartoonist named Kevin Sacco, who took your class, your night class at SVA 44 years ago. And said, he's not going to remember me. I don't expect him to, but changed his life. Um, he also sent a assignment, uh, a painting that um, apparently it was like a weekly assignment oh. you had for him. And he admitted he was aping your style uh, a bit at that point and And just wanted to... Well, I to, think that's very interesting. Yeah, it's his uncle and grandpa. I, I'll send you his email with the, the notes about it. But um, it was... He wrote me this morning with... Uh, just tell him how much his work meant to... Or that the class meant to me and, and you know, help shape his, uh, his art and his career. So. That's great. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I could do is to go back to teaching. And uh, um, I've been thinking about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, no. I, the, I I gave up teaching when we moved out to Sag Harbor full time. I've had the house in, I had the house in Sag Harbor since 1970, but it was a weekend house, you know. And yeah. I mean, we did stay there in the summers, but but then we decided uh, after 2002 that uh, let's live there all full time, and so we lived there for for ten years full-time, and th that's when I stopped teaching, because I tried the commute, but it was... It's a long yeah, haul. <laughs> yeah, it's a long haul, yeah, so uh, it meant, basically, I had to go in the night before, and yeah. I think you've had a, an amazing career up to now, and I, I look forward to seeing more work out of you, so, you know, you, you better oh, keep wow. painting. <laughs> That scares me. <laughs> I know, but you know, I've got high expectations. So. But Jim, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate the time and just the, well, again, getting to see such amazing work over the, the course of the day well, so thank far. Thank you. Well, your questions are very thoughtful, and uh, you obviously uh, know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> And that was James McMullen. His new book is Hello World from Pointed Leaf Press. It's really, it's gorgeous, amazing collection of drawings. And and they really form a, a kind of intimate companion, a private companion in a sense to, to his public work. All those Lincoln Center posters and magazine illustrations and, and SVA posters and, and children's books and the like. You may also want to check out his book book on, well, the book High Focus Drawing, and explore, which explores, sorry, um, his approach or method to, to drawing the human figure, because it's not just a, well, as he talks about it, not a technical slash, you know, here is how to draw a book, but more about how to see and how to appreciate what you're seeing. Anyway, you should check out his site, jamesmcmullen.com, to see more of his art, check out his books, his writing, his exhibitions, interviews, and, and more. And that's J-A-M-E-S-M-C-M-U-L-L-A-N.com. He's not on social media, which, as we all know, is for the best. Um, and I'll have a link to this, uh, along with a bunch of his art, in the show and episode notes for this one. Now, you can support the Virtual Memories show by uh, telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast comes out every week with great conversations with cultural figures, artists, writers, cartoonists, musicians, translators, and all sorts of other interesting people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, who you'd like to hear me record with, what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or art exhibition or, or theater or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. And you can do that by sending me a postcard. I love postcards, a uh, letter, direct message, email, or by leaving a message in my Google voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail. So you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you're going to go longer than that, just call back, leave a second message. 
Um, and let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting that I would love to share with the listeners, but I would never do that without getting your permission first. Now, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, you know, the show cost me a little bit, 40 bucks a month for web hosting and for um, the remote podcast service I use. And in this case, money for tolls, parking, etc. Oh, this uh, we recorded when it was uh, about five degrees uh, Fahrenheit outside. So the seven and a half block walk from my garage to Jim's place left my beard completely frozen and me looking like a... Uh, kind of scrawny Viking walking down the, the streets of New York City. Anyway, if you do have money to spare, um, give it to people or institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, uh, Indiegogo, Crowdfunder, and other crowdfunding platforms. And if you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, I give to my local food bank. I make occasional contributions to the Poor People's Campaign. I make targeted election contributions. I give to Freedom Funds, uh, Planned Parenthood, Women's Choice. There, there are a lot of different foundations and funds you can give to to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going. 